Well, thanks to my sympathetic straw man video, not only do I have a much bigger audience than I did before, but now I'm officially monetized. Just a heads up for my previous videos, there's a few things that have changed for when they were first uploaded. Apparently the use of trailers can lead to videos being hampered in the algorithm because of copyright laws and there's some other bits and bobs. So if you see any changes in my videos, it's because of that. But first off, let me say that I really appreciate everything surrounding this video, whether it be praise or criticism. It's helped me to have a bit more confidence and motivation on getting videos out, as well as some things to take into consideration when making future videos. Now, the main reason I'm making this video was because I saw a lot of questions and debates going on in the comments, and a lot of these comments were saying the same things, and instead of doing a bunch of comments, I thought I'd just do this video instead. I think this is a much more practical use of my time, and hopefully everyone one will just be able to look at it and go ah oh, so that's what you meant. Before we get to the examples used within the video I want to apologize for the caption colors that I used. Now I was trying to keep it blue and red keep up the whole Captain America vibe to it and when I was editing it in Premiere Pro it looked fine to me however after looking at it on YouTube from an audience perspective yeah the red is far too thick and too bright so I very much apologize to those who took the time to read those words on screen especially to RoboChamp1. Sorry pal. Now I think the biggest thing I want to address is the whole Logan and Fable 3 part. Now many people pointed out that using the game's mechanics it is entirely possible to pick both the good options and have the money needed to save all the citizens of Albion. And you're right, from a purely gameplay perspective you can do that. You can do odd jobs and buy property and the game world will never progress until you continue the main storyline yourself. However I wasn't really trying to address this from a gameplay perspective but more of a narrative one. I tried to look at it from the same perspective that a film or a TV series would look at it instead of just stopping time because the main character isn't doing anything that will stop Logan. Let me just go into depth with my line of thinking and then at the end you can agree or disagree. You see, as soon as your hero flees the castle at the beginning, you immediately go around recruiting as many allies as possible in order to take down Logan. Now, when your main goal is to retake the castle and overthrow Logan, I think it's fair to say that, from a narrative perspective, it makes little sense for the hero to waste time working as a blacksmith for several months until they save up enough money to buy a house and rent it out. It definitely doesn't make sense from this perspective for them to do this repeatedly until they've bought all the estate in Albion. That's not the main goal of the hero, they don't have time to waste on this from a narrative point of view. Now, during the hero's journey, they travel to Aurora and discover that most of the civilization that lives there has been exterminated by an entity known as the Darkness, being led by the Crawler. And that what is left of Aurora is barely clinging to life and they are constantly under the threat of death because they were not ready to face the darkness. Your hero sees all of this in their journey there, and sees firsthand how much of a threat this darkness is, and that everything that Logan has done has been in an effort to try and stop it. So, you return to Albion and lead your revolution against Logan, stripping him off his throne. However, because of your revolution, both the army that Logan had trained up and the gold used to finance the kingdom has been drained leading Albion to be extremely undefended, with us then discovering that we have one year to somehow not only restore the resources that were lost in the revolution, but to somehow gain even more than what Logan managed to obtain in the years where he was king. Now the choices that you make as king and the morality behind them will seem entirely different depending on how you look at the story, whether from a gameplay or a narrative perspective. If you look at these events from a gameplay perspective, then as many have pointed out in the comments, you're right, you could just stop with the main quest, keep raising money and buying property, and wait until you have enough so that you can donate all of it to the treasury and keep your promises. The timeline of the story will not progress no matter how many days you spend doing your own thing, the passage of time will just stop until you're ready to continue. And while waiting to get this money can be a bit boring and a repetitive task, it is a completely valid method to complete the game. However, as I said, I wasn't really looking at this from a gameplay perspective, but from a narrative one. If this was made into a TV show, the one year time limit isn't going to stop so we can have three episodes where the hero becomes the biggest real estate baron in Albion history, with time only resuming when the hero is ready. From a narrative perspective, the darkness is going to keep making its way to Albion within the year. The hero wouldn't have time to go out and explore and look at investment opportunities. They would have to start making decisions immediately without delay. And if we look at it from this perspective, where the only way that this army is going to be able to defeat the darkness is through hard 
hard work and sacrifices, then it makes sense that the hero's allies would come off as extremely unsympathetic because of how they react to this situation. Especially as they know that if money is spent giving back the resources and restoring their villages, millions of people are going to die. I'm not saying that they don't have a right to be angry at Logan, he could have maybe tried to explain things a bit better to them, but at the same time, if word spread to the people of Albion that an evil entity was coming to destroy them all, wouldn't that just cause mass panic and people to flee to other places, leaving Albion defenceless? So that's where my head was with that one. I was thinking of it as a logical continuity instead of thinking from it from a gameplay perspective. Of course, whether you think that perspective is right, that depends on you. I personally like to look at it from the narrative perspective. I'm very much interested in, you know, stories and how they play out. Um, but again, if you want to just judge this from a gameplay perspective, it is a game that's completely fair and logical. The second one I wanted to address is the Red Hood. Now when I was talking at the beginning of the video, I wrote that it's not just about characters that are extremely well written to the point that we sympathise with them. It's about the writers doing very little to make us see the actions of the protagonist as correct, until it reached the points that their arguments struggle to go up against this straw man character. Now I do believe that Jason's tactics are condemned by the writing because at the end of the day he is on the side of the criminals. He does kill people without remorse and he does endanger the lives of innocent people. People. We are not supposed to view his actions as right. My point here wasn't that Jason is in the right, my point here was that Batman does such a poor job at explaining his position that it's difficult to root for him. I mean for a start, Batman says that if he killed the Joker, then he'd probably just keep on killing. And I must say, it's a bit of a character assassination in my eyes to tell me that the only reason why Batman isn't a complete sociopathic serial killer is because of the law and because he wants to kill people so badly he doesn't know if he'd be able to stop. Not because he wants to have hope in people and therefore doesn't want to kill them. I think that's how Batman was always started as and that's how he should be kept as, so having this I want to kill people aspect just sort of ruined that a bit for me. Secondly, the reason why Jason comes across as more sympathetic in my eyes is because he gives reasons for why he believes in killing the Joker. And they're pretty solid reasons. How many times has the Joker just managed to escape? How many times has he endangered the city or killed hundreds, maybe thousands of people? Those are valid arguments and criticisms of the way that things are. And what does Batman give in retaliation? He doesn't really give anything. That was my point in this segment, that Batman comes off as less sympathetic because he doesn't offer anything for the audience to agree with. Which is strange because even as someone who isn't really against the death penalty, even I can give valid reasons as to why you shouldn't just execute people. For instance, in this scene, Batman could have actually just pointed out that some criminals do reform and repent for what they do, and become good, active members of society. And if you kill them, you remove that possibility. You remove that possible goodness from the world. He also could have pointed out that you have to take into account that the mentally ill are not functioning on the same level as everyone else, so it's hard to hold them accountable for their crimes because they're not even really thinking about it sometimes. So that's what I was trying to get at with this Red Hood part, because I think they didn't really put in enough effort to give Batman some actual reasons as to why he's right and we're just expected to agree with him because he's Batman. And with the Injustice Superman one, that one could be argued a bit more. However, in the first few issues after he kills the Joker, the most we see him do is say that from now on he isn't going to just sit back and let people die, and then we see him stopping governments from bombing innocent civilians. It's only after his family is killed by the government and Batman acts extremely uncaring and untrustworthy to him that he starts to slip further into villainy. I mentioned in the video that the writers seem to struggle to try and find ways to make sure that Batman is the protagonist and make sure that Superman just keeps slipping into villainy, so most of the time they just have him jumping through hoops while Batman just lectures people while offering no solutions to the situation. Again, it's not necessarily about fully agreeing with the person in it, but it's more about the fact that the main protagonist doesn't really offer anything to get behind either. Maybe I could have chosen a bit of a better example for this series that seems to be a bit better written, but this is the example that I went with so here we are. We have the X-Men one. For a start let's just get the obvious fact that I don't believe in committing genocide against people out the way. I don't know how people somehow came to that conclusion when I'm talking about a fucking cartoon character but here we are. Secondly a lot of people have pointed out that in the comics there's plenty of other superpowered beings that are running around that aren't mutants. So why do I think it's reasonable for people to be tested to see if they are mutants and then put on a register but that I don't think these people should be? 
Well, because like I said in the video, mutants have the ability to accidentally kill people because of their powers, especially when they themselves don't even know if they have powers in the first place. And so precautions could be taken to stop this if they just keep an eye on the individual in question. There's one comic I remember seeing ages ago that I can't really remember the name of now, but the story revolves around Wolverine tracking down a mutant whose powers activated on his birthday. Because he didn't know that he was a mutant or had the potential to be a mutant, and because no one else knew this information either, no one took any precautions in case he couldn't control his powers, and so he accidentally killed hundreds of people, and the only reason Wolverine can talk to him is because he has a healing factor. In the end, the kid is unable to control his powers, and because he's such a dangerous individual, Wolverine has to kill him. Now, to me, that sounds like a pretty dangerous scenario to just not take any sort of precautions for, so if the choice you have is being put on a register or accidentally killing people, then I think the register sounds like a more reasonable idea. You also have to think about mutants that might use their powers for smaller crimes, maybe it's not killing people or world ending events, but still crimes. What if you did have someone like Kitty Pride phase their way into a bank to rob it, and because you didn't know which person is associated with that power set, then you wouldn't even begin to narrow down the list of suspects who could be involved in it. Also, the thing about Senator Kelly is that a lot of these what-if scenarios where the future for the mutants is just an absolute hellscape, it usually comes because Senator Kelly gets killed. In fact, days of future past, in the original comic, that happens because Senator Kelly was killed, and so he got replaced by a much more anti-mutant senator. Yes, yeah, sometimes Kelly struggles to find the right course of action, but he's not a monster, he doesn't want to wish genocide on people. It's just in the end people use his actions and his possible deaths to use that to justify their genocidal actions. So it's pretty hard to blame Kelly for that. Now onto the Walker segment, and a few things I've seen people say about my assessment on him and his actions throughout the TV show, and my responses to those comments. Number 1. The writers did do a good job. Walker is supposed to be a sympathetic villain. Firstly, as far as I can tell, the only villainous thing he does is killing the terrorist, and even that is debatable. That was the point of his portion of the video, to show off how outside of how the protagonists and how the story tries to write him, he is genuinely a heroic figure who has a slip up. So if you've watched my video and still genuinely see him as a villain, I'm gonna need you to explain this to me because I'm not seeing it. Secondly, my point surrounding this video is that the antagonist is a lot more sympathetic and understandable in their actions than the good guys. I'm not saying that this antagonist is necessarily 100% in the right, but they give more to offer than the protagonists in the story. So from this point of view that the writers deliberately made Walker sympathetic, then by that logic you're also saying that the writers intentionally designed Sam and Bucky to be completely unsympathetic throughout this whole TV show. And considering that they're the two heroes of the story, I highly doubt that that was their intention or that's what Marvel wanted them to do. Number 2. Walker didn't need to kill the terrorist. He was surrendering, didn't have any weapons, and they could have just arrested him. Steve didn't kill surrendering people. Now, even if we ignore the mental health and the grief aspect of this scene, I still don't think there was much of a choice. It's not like Walker can just slap some handcuffs on this guy. These guys can bend steel beams. Putting handcuffs on this guy would be like putting elastic bands around his wrists. Saying that just because he doesn't have a physical weapon on him means he isn't a threat is as stupid as saying that Superman or the Hulk are also unarmed. On top of that, these people aren't the most mentally stable individuals and they've shown in the past that they have no problem killing innocent civilians. What's to stop him from escaping the first chance he gets and endangering these people? Or killing the police trying to take him away? Like I said, maybe Walker could have done something different, but I'm not really going to hold this over his head. Also, Steve didn't kill surrendering people. You're right. Sometimes he just killed people without even giving them the option of surrender, even when that was a choice he could have done. I mean, I included this clip into the video for a reason. He just straight up, without warning, kicks this dude into the side of a ship, bending the metal and snapping his spine, and then lets him fall overboard to slowly drown to his death. Steve could have just knocked him out. The only difference between these two is that Walker did his executions in public, while Steve did it in private, so he gets no shit for it. Number 3. Walker attacking the funeral could have endangered lives of non-combatants. Now, this idea does have a bit of validity to it, but I also don't think that this makes him look villainous or Sam's plan less stupid. For a start, trying to keep this thing contained would be a good way of separating people who support the Flag Smashers from the rest of the city population. 
Every adult in this room is willingly shown support for Carly, even if they're non-combatant, so keeping them in this building would stop them from slipping away into the crowds of more public areas of the city and endangering people who have no connection to the terrorists. Then there's the children. I don't know about you, but I think it's fair to say that the team aren't just going to start firing into the crowd, or throwing flashbangs or whatever. It's quite clear that Walker plans on making his appearance very public when he arrests Carly. Moving in as a team would mean that everyone can cover an exit to stop the flag smashers from running away, and at the same time it allows them to filter the children and non-combatants out of the room. I'm not saying it would be the perfect plan, but this is a terrorist situation, and trying to stop a terrorist situation when they've managed to get out and into the general public would be an even worse thing to happen. We also see throughout the MCU just how skilled and experienced Sam, Bucky and Zemo can be when it comes to picking the correct targets and thinking fast on their feet. While we don't see Lamar engaged in combat that often, we do see that he's competent enough that he can stand his ground, and Walker is shown having exceptional fighting and shooting skills in the truck fight scene, doing things like this without hesitation and with extreme accuracy. On top of this, had the writers bothered to remember that Sam is a superhero with access to advanced pieces of military hardware, they could have had both his uniform ready to attack and had Sam use his x-ray vision to look into the building, check the layout of the facility, check how many flag smashers and non-combatants there is, and then launch a plan to attack the flag smashers when they were separated from the civilians. All they would need to do is keep quiet and not lose their element of surprise, and then slowly surround the flag smashers so they cannot escape once they notice an opening between them and the non-combatants which would have ended the conflict right then, or at least leave them leaderless. But as I said, the writers keep forgetting that Sam has his equipment unless it's useful for the plot or an action scene, and then he takes charge and gives away the element of surprise. So yeah, thank you for watching this follow-up video. This is the first time I've ever had to do this, so it's a bit weird, but it's good that the video got such a good reception that I felt like I should address some of the commentary around it. But yeah, if you haven't already, please consider liking and subscribing, check out some of my other videos, and even consider my Patreon. I also have a Twitter and sometimes I do live streams. But overall, I just hope you had a great day, and hopefully I'll see you in the next video.